Good day, everybody. This is Cece Doucette from Massachusetts for Safe Technology. I'm the director there, as well as the Education Services Director for the international nonprofit Wireless Education. And our hope is to teach the public about the risks of today's wireless technology and at the same time teach ways that we can all have safe, efficient, super fast technology, primarily through hardwiring with ethernet cables and adapters to our devices indoors. You just plug these in through the back of your router. It's not rocket science to fix. With the uh, devices that we have control over. So, what we're going to spend our time talking about today is perhaps some of the areas that we don't have direct control over that put these microwave radio frequency wireless transmissions into our communities. And I want to give a, a deep shout out to our friends here at WCCA TV in Worcester for allowing us to have this time with you today to talk about safe technology solutions. So joining me today via Zoom is our guest, Ann Savastano from Keene, New Hampshire, where we got together on Monday and she brought me in to present educational information to her Rotary Club and then we went over to the library and did an educational forum for the afternoon. So welcome, Ann. Can you please tell us Thank a you. little bit about yourself and how you got involved in the wireless issue? Well, yes, um, we moved to, my husband and Tom and I moved to Keene almost seven years ago, and we're in a lovely Victorian house that is on the state historic register um, in a historic district close to the downtown of Keene. And, um, you know, just, just beautiful. Everyone has gardens and fruit trees and things like that, even though it's near the downtown. And um, I... Uh, I do have some health, some chronic health issues, which um, are concerning. And I know that I probably do have the hypersensitivity to EMF um, from things I've observed in the past. And uh, there is a, a rollout beginning in Keene of the um, 5G, 4G tower and antennas, the 4G towers that support the 5G antenna. And um, we were notified of this i've i've suspected for a long time i love i love nature i've been involved with the audubon society and so forth with birds and migration and we have noted obviously the decline of many species of migratory birds and also i think everyone's noted the decline of honeybees due to many different factors including colony collapse but what is causing this and so I've, I have suspected um, that the increased electro smog could be a cause of this, particularly with migrating birds and bees that rely on the Earth's uh, low electromagnetic field. Um, but I haven't really either had the time or when I've looked quickly, been able to find much science on that. Yeah, so and that's because for a long time. If, if I could interject yeah. there, there is a wealth sure. of scientific literature on the biological effects to our pollinators and all flora and fauna. And in fact, last week on Thursday, the Environmental Health Trust, under the directorship of Theodora Scarato, co-hosted a wonderful forum all about the environment, and they brought in many of the world's leading experts. So if folks want to go out to the Environmental Health Trust, you will be able to find that video soon there. That's ehtrust.org. You can also go to the resources page at Massachusetts for Safe Technology, and we have a link there to a lot of the science on the planetary impact of today's electro smog, as you called it. So, yeah, and, and it's hard, you know, none of us ever imagined we'd have to find time to look at this increasing threat in our environment. So we know we all do this on borrowed time. At the same time, we try to balance our own lives and our health and our interests. So just know the information is there for our entire audience if they wish to go and see what does the science say as far as the environment goes. And of course, there's a very robust body of science on what this radiation is doing to you and I as well. Yeah. Yes, and I did 
managed to watch a brief portion of that um, last Thursday in between some other things that we were doing. And um, I was struck by the scientist who did, who was talking about birds in particular in Florida. And he said, this is a much greater threat um, to actually the the destruction and disappearance of species and decline of species to their actual extinction than climate change. He, he recognized climate change is a factor, but that this, the correlation with the increase in electrosmog and the decline of these species is, um, is undeniable. So I would absolutely endorse watching that and, and others. And I guess, I think I heard that Within the recent years, about 583 studies have come out, particularly about insects, bees, you know, flora, fauna, fauna wildlife. Um, but to go, to go back to the history here, it was um, it was basically in it was a very it's been a very steep learning curve because I talked at the end of March through the director of public works here, and I know in some cities decisions about these towers go through the city council or select men. And in others, it, it's relegated to the public works department. And in this case, it's public works department. So I did talk to the director and said, well, I heard, you know, we gotten some notification, this might be happening in our neighborhood. Um, there was one letter sent out to 300 feet radius of where this will be and said, when is this scheduled? what permits have been granted at this point and how much time do we have? And he said, well, I did get the licensing permit in January, but so far as I know, the building permit and excavation permit have not yet been been provided. And the um, we, we have no schedule from Tilson Tech, the site developer hired by US Cellular to put these in. And so he said, sometimes, you know, I give the licensing permit and it never happens. Yeah. Later, that a digging construction crew appeared, dug the hole in the trenches in two days, and uh, told us that within two or three weeks, the they expected the tower to be installed. We did. Subsequently, they have poured the concrete for the base. So far, we had a whole week of rain last week, thank goodness. and uh, But uh, so far, that has not been erected. And meanwhile, we, myself and others in the neighborhood and others in our community at large, what we can do to either delay the construction of the tower in our neighborhood, in this historic, primarily residential neighborhood, or um, to stop it altogether. So that's a little bit of the history and a lot's happened in the last few weeks. Well, Anne, that's terrific. And thank goodness to you and your neighbors for tuning into this issue. Uh, can you help us to understand some of the steps you've taken toward educating the community? How do you start this conversation when you know something bad is impending? Well, the first thing that, that I did after talking with the director of public works was to, um, I was in contact with Deb Chandler about getting hold of the generation zapped film um, and then plan to invite people, which we did, to, of the neighborhood to see that. Use their uh, little auditorium and audio visual equipment if you have it as a public meeting, which of course we did free of charge. So. Um, I was able to find out that our library actually has Generation Zapped on their live streaming um, resource. So we did not have to pay the $175 licensing fee that we otherwise would have had to pay to do it that, ourselves. That is um, terrific. And we got, yeah, yeah so and we got word is, out fairly quickly. This is Generation Zapped for those who haven't watched it yet. And as Ann said, most of our libraries are carrying this in their streaming services such as Canopy or Hoopla. And it's a wonderful way to open the conversation. A lot has changed though since this film was released in 2018. Like the FCC has been sued for ignoring 11,000 pages of scientific evidence of harm. And uh, we have the Pittsfield, Massachusetts case where Verizon put a cell tower on top of this neighborhood 
and 17 children and adults and their pets became so ill that they had to abandon their homes. And for the first time in the United States, their city council commanded their Board of Health to do an investigation. They spent 15 months looking at the case history, speaking to doctors who had given diagnoses of electrical sensitivities, talking to world leading scientists and engineers, and listening to what the industry had to say. And it turns out that one of the, the so-called experts they brought in to kind of appease the town and say, oh, there's nothing wrong with this cell tower, Turns out he had no qualifications in the area of electromagnetic radiation. He is a physicist who specializes in quarks, et cetera. So we need to be very careful where we're getting our information from because we know the industry got a really big head start. So we're so very grateful that we do have resources like Generation Zapped, like the materials at the Environmental Health Trust, and they are actually one of the organizations that sued the FCC for ignoring this vast body of science showing harm. So I commend you for plucking up the courage to say, hey guys, I think we have a problem here, and then organizing with your neighbors because this is a really hard needle to move if you're just one voice because most of our towns have received all this disinformation from the industry. They know they're gonna get a revenue stream from allowing this toxic technology, they don't know it's toxic, but it is toxic, in to the public access way. The towns get a revenue stream from that. So it sounds appealing and you can't hardly fault them, but once they know, then it's their opportunity to learn and to do better. And I remember uh, pre-pandemic, Keene, New Hampshire City Council was given the opportunity to learn about this issue through a New Hampshire resident by the name of Lori Schreier. And Lori uh, consulted with me and we helped to clear up a lot of the questions that the City Council had. And at that point in time, they knew that New Hampshire was the first state in the nation to actually pass a law to investigate the health and environmental impacts of 5G. And so to Keene's huge credit, their city council voted that they would put a hold on any new applications for any new wireless infrastructure. And on that commission with the New Hampshire State Legislature, there was a woman by the name of Beth Ann Cooley who was appointed to serve on that commission as a representative of the industry for the Cellular Telecommunications Industry Association, or they call themselves today, CTIA, the wireless industry. And so Beth Ann Cooley attended all those meetings with world leading scientists and doctors and other public health experts. So she was hearing firsthand that there is grave danger to having wireless technology in our communities at close range. But that apparently didn't stop her. My understanding is that she met with the um, mayor of Keene, and I can't tell you what she said to him, but the end result was that he asked his city council to do a re-vote a re on that temporary ban, because all they were saying is, Let's just wait, let's put a pause on until New Hampshire has a chance to investigate and then we'll make decisions based on what the state finds. So Beth Ann Cooley knew that determination was coming up from this commission at the legislature and she got the mayor to do a revote and your city council voted eight to seven to remove that temporary ban, which is how I think you guys probably wound up with an impending cell tower right on the corner inside your neighborhood. And just so folks know, the New Hampshire legislature did their homework for a year, even during the pandemic, and they document the conflicts of interest with the wireless industry and our Food and Drug Administration and our Federal Communications Commission because our federal agencies, not one of them has ever done the review of the scientific literature. And so bless New Hampshire, they did their job. They document the harm and make 15 recommendations to transition away from wireless technology because wireless is no longer advanced technology. 
Our communities should be investing in fiber optics or high-speed cable to and through the premises. And then, as we've discussed in earlier episodes, you just hook up indoors with Ethernet cables and turn off the wireless antennas. And not only is it safer, but the signal is so much more reliable. It's faster. Your data and your privacy are far better protected with hardwired connections. And it consumes the wireless infrastructure and all of our devices consume 10 times more energy than simply plugging in and using hardwired connections. So I know that you have been working very hard uh, both sides of the coin. You've been working with your neighbors and you've also been working with your town. And I understand you were at a meeting this week to discuss this very issue. Yes, um, our, we had put together a petition and um, we had 39 neighbors sign it in a very short period of time. So obviously we only, we were only able to contact them, maybe half of them at, to get the signatures. And we had, of course, a cover letter listing all of the, of the different issues that we had questions about and objected to. And that was put on the agenda for the city council um, a, a week ago yesterday on Thursday, and they referred it, as is the usual procedure, to the to a committee, which is the Planning, Licensing, and Development Committee, PLD, which had their meeting Wednesday night. And um, this was therefore on the agenda. There was a second petition that a judge, a former judge, highly respected and keen, although now a nonagenarian, <laughs> but lives two doors from the site of this planned tower, and he had written up a second petition citing a number of different legal issues, including the precautionary principle, which I had, I familiarized myself with. So at the meeting Wednesday night, um, they had some other things on the agenda. So it was a three hour meeting, but two hours of that was spent with myself and the judge and talking back and forth with, with the committee the council members who were on that committee. There was, and the city attorney who was there and the head of the public works. So there was a very, very lively discussion. And I think that there are, there's a lot that will that was clarified, including the history, the past history of this. And there's a lot that can be done going forward that was discussed that may affect revision of the ordinance, but does not affect our immediate tower. So, and what we did find out, there were members of the of the PLD committee who said we would like to forward this back to the council, but we are required to do that with suggested recommended action. And there's actually no action that we as the council can take to stop your tower. That has to be done through the director of public works um, because it's basically in his purview, the licensing and so forth. There are a couple avenues we are still pursuing to do that. Um, and it's a time factor, of course. And a lot of that has to do with the fact this is a historic district. And at the very least, they may be required to do a, a, a pre-construction historic review according to um, FCC regulations, because this district is very probably eligible for the National Registry of Historic Places, which means the FCC regulation requiring this is, is applicable to our situation. So that's one thing we're reviewing, but it was a fascinating talk. And it turns out that the reason that the council ended up not accepting Lori Schreier's amendment to the ordinance governing these small wireless facilities is um, which in, in her ordinance, she recommended the setback of 1,640 feet, mm -hmm. which is a safe distance. You don't, the 5G only travel, 4G only travels that far carrying the 5G, those small cell towers from schools, from residences, from hospitals, from nursing homes, where there are people vulnerable mm -hmm. to uh, to the negative effects of this. It turns out, and the and the counselor who really had been very influential, who is an engineer, 
although he does only have his his bachelor's in chemical engineering, but he reviewed, said he reviewed all the studies from the New Hampshire Commission, all 400 or so pages, and said it's mostly bogus. And he's he just, in his free time, he's, he's been continuing to look at different studies, and he is convinced that five, there is absolutely no harm from 5G, that this is just incendiary, that people that are are saying there is harm are maybe fear mongers, they're evangelists, they're et cetera. So, but he he said that if he were in fact convinced that there was harm to environment or people, he would do everything in his power to try to restrict it. Um, but he said the fact that the 1,640 foot setback effectively banned 5G from going into hospitals, residences, schools, meant that, and he didn't want our our city to fall behind the, the wave of advanced technology and be therefore embarrassed. And uh, so, but it was a very interesting discussion with the result that we're probably going to set up a panel at the library, co-sponsored by the library, and they will do that as long as we have an equal number of panelists on both side of the sides of the issue to discuss this. Well, that so would, that, that was actually talked about. Yeah, that yeah. would be fantastic because it's not unusual that this engineer um, believes he knows what he thinks he knows because that's the information that's been promulgated by industry. So, it it would, that's often the starting point. So, I think it would be lovely to have a panel at your library. Um, perhaps it'll even be possible to get some of the members who served on this New Hampshire Commission because Dr. Kent Chamberlain, I think, was of like mind with this gentleman on your board. Dr. Kent Chamberlain is a career EMF medical device engineer. He is now the chair emeritus at the University of New Hampshire, and uh, he was a professor there, you know, he did this work for 30 years, and when he was appointed to this commission, he thought this was going to be a slam dunk. Of course, wireless is fine. And then when he started doing the research and looking at the journals that the science is published in, the industry will tell us, oh, that's just cherry picking. These are fringe journals. He collaborated with the librarians at the University of New Hampshire, and they vetted the science. And so they know this is not fringe. This is not cherry picked. The majority of the non industry funded scientific studies show clear evidence of harm. So I would be willing to bet that Dr. Kent Chamberlain, if the date works out, would be more than honored to join you in Keene for that panel. You could also check with Representative Patrick Abrami, and he is the one who wrote the initial bill to form this commission, and he wound up becoming the chairman of this commission. So Pat Abrami, Kent Chamberlain, and others. Uh, I believe on that environmental um, forum that was held last week, uh, one of the leading scientists on that is Albert Manville, and he's out of Maine. You might even be able to get Mr. Manville to come down and join you for that as well. A word of caution about inviting the industry. I was invited to join a forum at the State House in Michigan, along with a number of other scientists and doctors and captains of industry, and of course, the wireless industry was invited. And one gentleman who owns a telecom company, he came for the morning session, and once he started hearing the facts on this, he declined to speak, and then he didn't come back for the afternoon session because he knew that anything that he had to contribute was not going to be helpful to furthering the, te the, se the safe technology conversation. So I would be surprised if the industry accepts the invitation, but so long as the invitation is extended, hopefully that will be enough to um, make it possible to have this forum at your library. So that would be great. Yeah. Um, I just need to click one thing here on our Zoom account. Uh, and we have about three minutes left. So if you had suggestions for others in your position, what might that be when you wake up and you find out there's a cell tower going into your neighborhood? 
Uh, one, um, if you have, depending on the form of government you have, um, obviously the warrant article on the basis of the of the FCC not having complied with the court order of two years ago that has worked in Sheffield, Great Barrington, Mass, is one, if you have a town hall, we do not. Otherwise, um, I've been advised by a city councilor that the more people show up at hearings, write petitions, that kind of thing, the more the city council takes note. Um, and, you know, it will at least affect future ordinances. Uh, another is to investigate. Do you have, has a review been done? Because it sounds like that was required for every single site that in New York City. That, uh, I'm sorry, the, we had a little bit of an audio glitch there. What was the review? Um, it was the pre-construction historic review that the company, the site developer or the or the telecom is required to carry out by the FCC in accordance with both NEPA, um, which is an environmental review, the uh, National Environmental Policy Act, mm -hmm. and in accordance with the NHPA, which is the National Historic Preservation Act, to make sure that there are no violations that they're that what what they're planning to do will be consonant with those acts at every single site that's excellent and and i know that you've spoken with Wrote legal counsel that, that did that so yeah. yeah so i know you've spoken with legal counsel as well who specialize in telecom law so that would also probably be a good piece of advice is don't wait at least do the initial consult so that you understand what your rights are and what might help right. to stop these close range antennas until the FCC is held the, accountable. Okay. The other thing is to really explore the precautionary principle, which is accepted worldwide. That was a new area for me. It can be very powerfully used as a legal persuasion argument. Okay. Well, Anne, thank you so very much for taking time out of your incredibly busy week. I know it's been a doozy for you, um, but we're so grateful yeah. that you are such a peaceable person. Uh, and that you come from the heart when you work with your neighbors and that you work with your town because we all want to get to safe technology in our communities and having the right kind of uh, atmosphere to do that in is incredibly helpful. So we're here listening, learning from what you're doing, and we look forward to following up with you in the future. So we thank everybody who's joined us today at WCCA-TV. And we encourage you all to have a tech safe day and let us know how we can help at Massachusetts for safe technology. Thank you.